everybody, a quick note about our precision medicine training program. It's been a really popular course. We're constantly hiring health coaches and physicians, but we're only hiring them as we grow if they're trained in precision medicine. You don't get that in medical school or other places. And so we've developed this training program and we've completely revamped it recently. It's a lot more robust. So now there's still over 50 hours of live synchronous training. There's also all the asynchronous credit over 50 hours of content. Um, And as a physician, you get about 50 hours of AMA category one CME credit, which is a nice benefit for the health coaches going through the training program. It's now accredited by the national board of health and wellness coaching. So graduates are going to meet the requirement to sit for the board exam and become board certified health coaches. There's a lot of benefits to that, not just the certification, but also when it comes to things like insurance reimbursement. So it's a really robust program. If you're a physician, a nurse practitioner, a PA, or someone that just wants to be a health coach, um, it's open to all of those categories. There's the six-month program that's kind of the full program. And then we also have just a fundamentals of precision medicine course, which is completely on your own. It's online. It's all asynchronous. You still get the 50 hours of AMA Category 1, but it's self-paced. And you still have access to the online community, but not all the synchronous lectures as well. So if you're interested in checking that out, go to wildhealth.com forward slash education. And we'd love to have you as part of our next class. So but I, I, I think I was the one who brought this up because uh, this is something that's near and dear to my heart for a multitude of reasons. But um, uh, I, I wanted to talk about adult ADHD. Um, and I want to talk about uh, particularly actually a book that you shared with me around the book called Stolen Focus that I've – I thank you again for sharing that with me. And that, But I, I just – I, I want to talk about like lifestyle management things that people can do outside of medication to to help with symptoms for ADHD. And but but I think maybe before doing that, maybe we should talk about the prevalence of ADHD and sort of the comorbidities that are associated with it. And that's why, obviously, yeah. you know, like me talking about this. Yeah, I have I have some real world experience, but I am certainly not an expert. And uh, why not bring in? an expert as yourself, Kristen Dawson. Oh, wow. That's yeah. heavy. Um, well, so you want to dive into um, how prevalent ADHD is and kind of start there? Yeah. Like I, so, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think we hear so much, right, about symptoms of ADHD. Um, and I really, um, I think these numbers continue to grow and there's some thoughts about why that might be. Um, But in general, we would say that um, about two to 5% of adults worldwide, you know, meet the criteria for having ADHD. Um, And I think it's important to also recognize that um, the vast majority of kids who get diagnosed with ADHD will continue to have that diagnosis into adulthood, um, despite a lot of recognition now and a lot of treatment and interventions for childhood ADHD. So um, I think the re- you know estimated amounts would be between 60 and I've seen you know as high as like 70 percent of kids will continue to meet the criteria for ADHD. So it's really something that people are going to be. Uh, as you put, um, managing uh, with or without um, uh, lifestyle modifications. But I would strongly recommend, it, you know, thinking about ways in which to manage symptoms effectively um, with things that don't necessarily always entail medication. Well, I mean, I, I think one of the things that I think about, um, but I, I don't know if everybody thinks about it, about the sort of other... I guess comorbidities associated with with ADHD, um, and it, not just specifically around attention, but uh, well, I think that's what everybody's like. Oh, you d- you have a hard time paying attention, and then therefore maybe the downstream effects are that uh, you don't get a task done in your life. Um, but I, I also I kind of think about it with other comorbidities like anxiety and depression. But I, I just wondered if you want to. If maybe I'm like way off base for that, um, and maybe. Maybe you could speak to that a little bit. Sorry, you broke up for just a second, Carl. What was that? Oh, sorry. So (laughs) I just wondered if you could speak about, like, the comorbidities with ADHD. I think about anxiety and depression and sort of the the downstream effects from that, not just about people's, like, inability to 
you know, you know, uh, complete a simple task. So comorbidities with ADHD are so high, so common. Um, pretty much anything I can diagnose um, in my office is going to, um, you're going to have a higher likelihood of having ADHD symptoms alongside alongside it. And so um, it's important to look for those comorbidities. It's important to understand that um, you know, for instance, today, actually, um, I had somebody coming in for an autism evaluation who was diagnosed with childhood ADHD. And um, sometimes the, the evaluation can stop with ADHD and not necessarily consider the broader phenotype or the broader set of symptoms that can co-occur with it. Um, so autism is a really comorbid um, condition with ADHD symptoms. Um, you're absolutely right. Depression, anxiety, substance use disorders are really comorbid with ADHD. So we know that um, your risk of uh, adolescent substance use um, and then adult substance use disorder going on to have a, a problematic addiction is really high if you have ADHD. Um, can, I, can I ask a question about that? Yeah. So do, you, do people in your line of work... Do they do they think of of those comorbidities, like like uh, specifically substance abuse or like anxiety? Like, is that a are those things will like are they genetically inherited together or are they are they like are you know with su substance abuse like maybe are people are treating um, their ADHD like you know their and or treating their anxiety? Um, it, it's like I know this is like maybe I'm splitting hairs here. But I, it's fascinating to me because it, it sort of feels like it would guide like my treatment for people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, let me give you an example of um, hair, something that's inherited together with ADHD. So um, Tourette's disorder, um, so a tick disorder, is highly heritable alongside ADHD and alongside OCD. Um, the genetic kind of uh, heritability is very, very strong for those conditions. And absolutely, you would want to know about those co-occurring disorders and, and learning disorder actually mm -hmm. yeah. is, also up, is also in there. And so it does change your treatment and your management um, when somebody has, for instance, um, a specific language-based learning disorder and they have ADHD on top of that. Well, then maybe your, your treatment plan in terms of how aggressively you treat the ADHD symptoms is going to be different because it impacts your ability to address with educational interventions the learning problem, the, the learning yeah. difference, right? Um, and then there's, you know, this is, uh, go, people go back and forth on this, but medications can sometimes, um, in individuals, change the frequency of the tick disorder. So, so it is really important to know the landscape. Um, with your question about what's maybe, what sometimes we talk about a primary diagnosis, right? <clears throat> and, and a secondary for, for, you know, somebody who has ADHD symptoms that maybe aren't getting the kind of treatment, educational supports, um, psychoeducation about that symptom complex. Um, life can become really overwhelming with all the tasks and all the kind of um, trouble functioning at school or in the workplace that come along with that. And, and absolutely, it can become really anxious. I see this quite, quite often, actually, is what I sometimes think of as anxiety that's secondary to poorly treated ADHD. Mm -hmm. Um, and then there are people that just kind of both are present and not, you know, one's not primary, one's not secondary. They're, they're both kind of uh, uh, along for the ride. So um, I, I do, though, think that in terms of uh, stepwise management of symptoms, it, it can be helpful to try and understand for the person, you know, what, what came first or what seems to be the driving force for some of the other problems. Emotional dysregulation is very common with somebody who has ADHD symptoms, um, meaning um, you can uh, have, have trouble managing strong emotions, and that can lead to problems in relationships, which can become stressors, which puts you at a higher risk of having a depressive episode for people who are, um, you know, maybe genetically at risk for that. So uh, all that to say, it's, uh, 
you know, I don't love having these silos of symptoms. I think um, we're moving eventually towards these domain criteria of, you know, types of symptoms versus, you know, you have this disorder, you have this disorder, and they're not related to one another. That's just not the case most of the time. Does that answer yeah, the question? <laughs> that, no, that, I mean, that's super good to hear, like, because I, I hear this in, I see people diagnosed with, like, what, you know, like, you have ADHD, you have anxiety, or you have ADHD, and you have this, like, learning process or sensory processing disorder or, or something, and they're, they're separated out. And I don't know, like, it, it, it's hard for me sometimes because it seems like when you see, you know, you'll see this in groups of families where there's these learning disabilities with this ADHD. And a lot of these people are sometimes are super high functioning, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they, they develop these, um, well, what's a, what's a good term here? So like a workarounds, it's not the, not yeah. the word, I'm worried, but like they, they develop these other abilities, these other skills really, really well to, you know, to make up for some, uh, you know, some difficulties they're having. Um, and, and, but it, my, I guess my question with this, this diatribe is, is do you see people kind of get to adult age and like, maybe they were able to, you know, get through high, junior high, high school, through what other mechanisms, but then they, they get to college or they get to, out in the workforce and they start to have exhibit symptom the comorbidity sort of symptoms of anxiety and depression at that point where they didn't really have that before is that 100%. like a, that's a happened picture? today <laughs> oh. just like an hour ago yeah Wait, 100%. it happened it happened today before this podcast Kristen. <laughs> are you referring yeah. to my difficulty signing on to this podcast no <laughs> no no i might be no. referring to With the, the other co-host Oh, the other oh, cost. Yeah. I was not referencing myself. I was just like, you know, um, okay. So you're 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 bringing up a really great point. Um, you hear that, Mike? So, Did you hear what she just said? Yeah. You're bringing up a very good point. You are. Congratulations. Because this, this happens to real people all the time. Yeah. Right. This this um, you know I see people coming in and they're really distressed because. They've always sort of known that they fall somewhere on, and I would just kind of even call it a spectrum of ADHD sim symptoms. Right. They're somewhere on that spectrum, but um, there were things in place, oftentimes environmental, structural uh, things in place, in addition to what you're calling a workaround or mm. strategies that they've been able to employ and do really well. Um, or, or function at a level that they're really happy with or, you know, feel like that it's, things are going well. And then allostatic load or, you know, stressor upon stressor occurs and it's no longer, it's no longer tenable to, to operate in that way. It takes too, it's too much of a lift. It's too draining. It's too, you know, whatever. And that's really distressing for people. It's, it, you know, leads to feelings of failure and lots of kind of negative self-talk and, um, you know, feeling like, well, why, why can't I handle this anymore? I used to be able to do this. And it, um, it's really painful. And, and there's a lot of suffering that co goes along with that. Um, so for instance, somebody, you know, even just earlier today, um, grief response, you know, untreated or kind of managed their ADHD symptoms really well um, and then you know lost a family member during the pandemic and lost a second one six months later and now you know it's it's not um, possible to, to employ the same strategies that used you know used to be helpful or uh, a different example would be I talked to a woman who grew up in um, a different country and she attended like a really structured, pretty strict Catholic school, mm -hmm. which had this really cool after school program where your homework was done with a cohort, a small cohort of your peers. So there was this interactive social component, sort of social pressures to, you know, attend to the task at hand and all these kinds of things. And then she moved to the United States, went to a, 
you know, kind of a typical American public school and there weren't the nuns, you know, <laughs> with, the, with, the, with the structure and there wasn't, you know, anybody after school making sure that, she, you know, and school all of a sudden, it, the ADHD symptoms were um, because of the change in the environment and the stress of the cultural, uh, you know, language change, you know, it just became unbearable. So it's almost as though it's an unmasking or it's a, um, the, the symptoms were there, uh, but life became too much and now there is a need to have some help. I don't know if that applies to your situation or not, Carl. Or I don't know. I don't know why we're talking to keep bringing this about me. This is not about me here. I don't know. No, we're not talking about Carl. Let's uh, t guys. Can, can you, uh, can you give me, I feel a little bit left out um, because I, uh, I, I didn't do my homework, um, which may or may not be attributable to adult strategies that no longer work for me. <laughs> used to work for me. We're, we're just going to leave yeah. that one alone. Um, yeah. But talk to me about stolen focus a little bit. Um, Cause I'd love to, I'd love to hear about like, yeah. you know, spare me the, uh, the audio book credit, Carl, and, and give me the, give me the short, the cliff notes. Like, what do I need to know? What, what'd you get out of this book? Well, can I, I'll go, Christy, you probably have a very articulate, uh, very well thought out. You probably remember all of the book cause you just, you know, because you're just a smarter, better human than me. But I, so, yeah, yeah, that's Carl, right. Come that on, man. So weird. Uh, so I kind of boil it down to this: is there, there is, um, and this, this, this kind of part of this. It kind of answers some of my questions that I had because you know maybe as a kid, maybe in rural Wyoming, um, I was the sole problem in some classrooms mm -hmm. and, uh, or somebody that a kid was a sole problem in some classrooms that people just didn't really know what to do with. And this was, you know, a while ago, whereas now I hear that like, you know, uh, there's the, the rate, like when I hear the two to 5% worldwide, I'm like, really? Cause it seems mm -hmm. like every time I turn the corner, somebody's like, yeah, you know, my, my kid has ADHD or like uh, I was diagnosed with ADHD. Um, and I, you know, I don't know if I'm living in an echo chamber or not, but, um, but I, I think stolen focus really kind of congealed a lot of thoughts I've been having about the, the world and the planet and things that are going on in our society into like why so many people are having difficulties with focus. And um, where people who were not having problems previously are now. And, um, and so w this, the story uh, of it kind of goes through, like, in a way, he goes through a list of different things that are happening around screen time, around computer algorithms that are set up to <clears throat> basically that, that social media entities are set up to um, – be incentivized to basically take our focus away. Um, and in addition, like he goes through things that we know, like sleep disruption, um, stress responses, and, and where society is dealing with stress response and sympathetic overdrive, um, and diet, and uh, you know things in our environment, like pollutions in our environment. But then he also talks about our genetics. And, th and this is where I kind of like, I don't know if I entirely agree with what I took away from the book and love to hear what you think, Kristen, but, um, that, that basically like there, I don't know. Well, there are people who, uh, are that maybe it's not as genetically linked as we previously thought. And that, um, that this is more of a societal issue, not a genetic issue. And I, I have a hard time with that, uh, admittedly. And, uh, and, and again, I may have taken away something different than you did, Kristen, but uh, I have a hard time with that because I've seen whole, you know, like family lines clearly line up of being like, <laughs> where I can, you know, look back in a family and be like, uh, that uncle, that uncle, that uncle, um, you know, and I, I see that. And so, but what I congealed in my brain is I, feel like there's this spectrum, as you say, of genetic risk that is in, 
there's almost like an epigenic response to what are things going on in society. There's, there's people that are predisposed to this, and you put them in the right environment at the right time in the right setting, and they're going to have significant attention issues, whereas you take other people and put them in the right, the, a different, or the same person, same genes, if you could do that, and put them in a different environment, they're going to respond completely differently. Not necessarily what I think the author seemed to be implying that they're almost was no genetic component to this that this is and that's what i maybe i heard but um kristen you want to <laughs> go 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 okay um what i appreciate about the book is that it helps us see the landscape of the environmental societal factors that um, interact with our genes to potentially amplify or um, maybe even unmask cases of more severe ADHD symptoms than perhaps would other, otherwise be present. And also, I think seeing the interplay of, as you mentioned, sort of the um, the AI algorithms or the um, culturally uh, informed um, sort of th th this culture of having to be on all the time and not valuing rest and restoration and you know the performance based stuff and um, what our work week looks like, what our employers yeah. expect of us. Um, the, the use of screen time in schools. All, all these factors, I think, um, are inter interacting with genetic variants that, as you, you know, like there are some families that clearly the ADHD, you know, their polygenic risk factors are yes. so high, right? And it's not yeah. gonna take a lot in their, in their environment to maybe, um, uh, push somebody into a really, you know, not being able to function well in that environment. But I, I do think that understanding some of these other factors that have nothing to do with, you know, our genetic makeup is helpful um, if we want to to make changes um, that support all these kids who are struggling with ADHD symptoms and all the, you know, adults who who as well. Um, without making it feel like, you know, one thing that I think he does a good job of it, it's like it's not, um, you know, people get maybe mislabeled as being unmotivated or lazy, like all those negative attributes that are internalized by children who grow up thinking that if I could only sit still, I would be of value or, you know, these messages that get perpetuated over time in our culture. Um, that lead to that dysphoria and, yeah. you know, the depression and the anxiety and all the other problems, the substance use later on. Um, I, I just, I like that it kind of swings things in a, in a way that, you know, you're starting to think, you know, okay, what, what is the culture doing to this biology that I'm working with here? <laughs> like, yeah. what, what is, what is being unmasked? What is, um, being perpetuated? What is, um, you know, not helpful and can I opt out of some of these things if I sh mm -hmm. choose to, you know, can I opt out of the highly processed foods and artificial dyes and et cetera? And, mm -hmm. you know, can I look at where my food comes from and you know, look at regenerative farming practices and farmers, you know, like what can, what is in my power to do? And, and um, I think that's helpful. I think it's a good, you know, it's not as though, what I what I worry about is the um, emphasis on you got diagnosed with ADHD. Are you going to medicate or not? Like, yeah, that's, yeah. Which I I, I understand. Yeah. Uh, I understand why that's coming up so often. Um, but I love that this is broadening the conversation about ADHD and ADHD symptoms to to more than. Um, you know, the teacher prompting, like, are you going to medicate or not? Yeah. You know, there's medicines for this and, you know, that kind of for thing. For sure. For sure. And I, I mean, I, <laughs> I don't want to like, I think maybe, maybe we should pause for a second and, and talk about this, but like, I, I don't want to, you know, I think there's some people that benefit from medication. I think there's some people that 
lifestyle modifications are going to be more powerful for. I think there's just because you're on medication doesn't mean lifestyle modifications aren't going to be helpful for you. Um, but maybe like if before we maybe, well, first of all, the book is still in focus. Uh, I think you can, maybe we can link that in the snow show notes, Mike, but, um, uh, but before we like maybe pivot to some lifestyle recommendations, Kristen, so if somebody's struggling with attention and like, or, you know, or they have children who are, or they're, you know, thinking about this or, you know, they have every one of their friends, you know, they're the punchline of ADHD jokes, which mm-hmm. I don't know anybody <clears throat> them like that. Like the, the, <laughs> well, no, it's all right. It happens. Oh, it happens. Okay. No, it's, it's, oh, well, that's okay. Like it's, it's, it, it, it helps you with humor. Um, and, uh, what, where, where would one go? Like, where would you have somebody start to kind of be, go down this pathway of, of getting themselves evaluated if they wish to. Hmm. You know, I almost, (laughs) sorry, I almost would go a different, I would almost have them read David and Goliath. I mean, I, I think that people get to a point where they're so down on Hmm. themselves and so frustrated with feeling like they're not functioning like the rest of the world that I, I almost would throw you off balance and have you read a book that helps you find either the superpower with an ADHD. <laughs> like, yeah. What is it about me that actually is working really above average before I necessarily dive into the parts that are not working quite as well? But that that's just my personal one. <laughs> yeah. I want people I, to feel like it's actually not all bad. There's actually some really, there, oh. there's reasons why these genes, this, this sort of set of genetic variants has persisted so long. And it's, you know, there, there are some really positive attributes. You mentioned humor. Um, you, you know, that's definitely one of them. Being, sure. you know, <laughs> being the person that brings joy into people's lives by doing yeah. offhand stuff is, is awesome. Um, having the ability to actually hyper-focus on yes. something because it's super interesting to them, yeah. um, way beyond what the rest, you know, the rest of the world might be able to tolerate, like going down that deep dive and really getting in there and understanding something on this, you know, incredible level, um, having the energy to persist when others are pooping out, like there's some really great things about ADHD. So anyway, that's my plug to, um, to balance the challenges with some sure. of the great strengths. Um, but you asked about getting evaluated. Um, yeah. Like if you, if someone were to want to get evaluated as an adult, we're trying to focus on adults. What would other than empowering them to sort of look at the positive aspects of. He didn't like that answer. You can go. No, I, I actually, I really professional. did. professional. Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I, 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 I actually really liked that answer, and I I was gonna say something similar but less articulate and not a book reference, um, but uh, but just I mean, do you just have people go to, you know, a local psychiatrist? Yeah, psychiatrist, um, psychologist. Um, you know, if you have concerns about anything other than ADHD. Um, in terms of a learning difference or, um, you know, that, that may be a neuropsychologist evaluation. But typically this can be done with, a, you know, a psychiatrist in a clinical interview, some rating scales, um, uh, if you're looking so, to be diagnosed and then start some treatment options. So one of, the, one of the things that I've told people when they've come to me for whatever reason uh, is to do, like, neuropsych as well because of the – comorbidities with learning disabilities that are seem so wildly prevalent. Um, do you recommend that? Or is it like, or is it just mostly go to psychiatry, psychologist, and then, I mean, it depends. Yeah, it depends on, um, yeah, it depends on the person's history and the, you know, particularly the educational history, right? <clears throat> if a person, someone who, um, you know, was always told that they were running around with a motor in them and they had to repeat maybe a grade or they struggled with math or they struggled with reading or they learned, you know, that may be somebody. But but I would say that um, 
if you started with a psychiatrist, they could hopefully tell you if the, the neuropsych testing made sense because it can be a very, I mean, it can be an expensive evaluation. Oh, yeah. And it, there's a, oftentimes the long wait to do the neuropsychological testing because that's, you know, sometimes four, six, eight hours worth of an, of an evaluation. Um, so it makes, for me, it makes more sense to start off with an hour-long evaluation with a psychiatrist. Okay. Yeah, I like that. That's, I like that recommendation. Do you, is that okay for you? <laughs> Does that feel better? <laughs> no, I think you're right. I mean, the, the, the cost is super high and also the time commitment. Like, to do a real, like, thorough neuropsych evaluation <clears throat> is not, like, an hour. It's, we're talking no. eight hours more. Right, um, right. And yeah. oftentimes it's all out of pocket. Or, you know, there's not for as sure. much reimbursement for that. Um, so I think it makes more sense to see a psychiatrist first. Right. Well, let's, let's talk about um, some, outside of medication, some lifestyle recommendations. And I kind of wanted to break these up into like maybe dietary supplements and then like maybe environmental um, if that's all right, that's the way it kind of made sense in my head, but, um, sure. um, what have you come across? I, uh, well, I, I mean, I, I think about it like a bunch of things. So I think of, I think of elimination diets for people. Um, and I, as far as from dietary and then elimination diets kind of sub to that is decreasing, you know, sugary processed foods, which I think is like, uh, it's one of those things that I was, as a kid, I was like, oh, that sounds like an old wife's tale, um, but uh, maybe maybe not. And then uh, omega-3 supplementation um, as well is something that's always kind of been floated out there. And, and kind of sub-diets, like specific diets, like outside of elimination, like Mediterranean diets um, that people uh, talk about. Um, do you, what do you, is that like a thorough list for diets? It's a great diets? list. Yeah. I mean, I think in general, what I, I would say is, um, there's this wonderful new field of nutritional psychiatry that is like basically four years old or five years old or something yeah. like in, in terms of a, you know, a, a recognized, uh, subspecialty within mental health, but my goodness, um, it, it just, uh, how, how can what we put into <laughs> our biology not impact the output that we get out of it in terms of just, you know, our brain functioning? And um, so <clears throat> the oldest, or, or I guess the, um, the oldest sort of intervention, dietary intervention for ADHD is only a couple decades old, which was the fine gold diet, um, which, you know, is not something that we would recommend right now, but just historically speaking, a pediatric allergist was actually the person who was looking at um, the effect that diet had on epilepsy and seizure disorders, and then sort of also discuss and, and obviously hives and, and allergic responses, but, but had this uh, insight that it might also help kids who had what they called sort of hyperkinetic syndrome or just, you know, moving quite a bit, like a similar symptom of ADHD. <clears throat> Excuse me. So, um, so at yeah, started to, as you mentioned, eliminate certain things from the diet that may be causing or exacerbating some of these symptoms of uh, inattention and hyperactivity. Um, so I think uh, the idea of getting rid of things that help you, that, that, that aren't helping you, makes a lot of sense as a place to start. And so, you know, the studies on eliminating sugary foods are kind of variable and, and go back and forth, but I think in general there are a lot of other health-related benefits to minimizing sugar. Uh, and you know, we're just coming off of Easter, and um, Peeps. <laughs> like Peeps. last yeah, night yeah. had yeah. so much sugar. Yeah. You know, I was like, this yeah. podcast isn't going to go well because I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm not really functioning well, but. Um, you know, I do think it makes sense for, especially, um, you know, I think it makes sense to eliminate sugar if you're able to, or to the degree that you're able to eliminate it. I think it makes sense. And this is, there's more research on eliminating food dyes, um, mm -hmm. coloring and, and food dyes. Um, but then there's a more kind of a stepped up diet that is, uh, you know, this sort of elimination diet or what was called the, um, what is the few foods diet, right? Yeah. So it's basically like, 
We're just going to try basic whole foods, you know, vegetables, fruits, a couple of meats, um, and see how kids do that, do on that diet. Mm -hmm. And actually that has the largest effect size. The effect size was in a moderate to large, um, effect size range, meaning it was a very effective intervention, just eliminating, um, you know, eliminating a lot of things, um, and, and focusing on just whole foods basically. Um, so, so there's that route that people can try, um, honestly, very hard with kids um, who are in school, who are in activities where unfortunately food and and processed foods can be used as reinforcers for good behavior. I mean, Mm -hmm. which is a problem, but, um, so, so I do think though, that there is something to that. Um, the omega, you talk about omega, I feel like you're the (laughs) omega-3 expert carl is that I, I something that you're implementing in your in your own diet yeah i mean i, I for for there's other reasons like, right it but could be. um uh definitely like omega-3 supplementation it's i i think that i'd be interested what you think but i think the data is sort of not that great but i, I feel like the downside is you know um, until you get to ultra high doses of omega-3s the downside of them is is dang near zero. <laughs> um, um, so I, I feel like there probably is some benefit for that. And there's, there's other like mental health, uh, benefits from omega-3 supplementation that people talk about in kids and adults. So, um, yeah, I, I, but admittedly like to be totally transparent, I, I feel like the omega-3, uh, supplementation data is, um, you know, like hit or miss. I don't know. Yeah. Um, certainly the effect size, if you look at a meta analysis, um, of supplementation is nowhere near what we just talked about that few foods diet. Yes. Yeah. Right. So if you were going to prioritize, you know, I I would, I would sort of focus on the whole foods kind of a approach rather than necessarily, um, Mm -hmm. trying to get your kid to to (laughs) take the fish, (laughs) the omega three, um, supplement all the time. Now, the I guess the other um, research that's starting to emerge is the Mediterranean diet for ADHD. And so rather than the focus on what we're getting rid of, it's, you know, what are we going to focus on? What is the majority of our diet going to look like? Um, and it looks like there's at least a couple studies to, to support the, the use of a Mediterranean diet. Um, and then actually more recently, a DASH diet. That's the diet... Um, for uh, the intervention for hypertension, so may also have benefits for ADHD. <clears throat> um, like so think, like all of these, I, maybe I'm like I, I I make these intellectual leaps that may make you wildly uncomfortable, Kristen, and that's fine. Just don't eat a bunch of crap, and and you're like like most things, you're gonna do better. Um, like don't eat crap, you'll do better. Um, maybe is it is that a can I boil it down to that or am I taking too much of a leap. No, I mean, I, I a hundred percent. Um, I mean, I just think it's so wild when we, when you, you know, you bring your newborn baby home, there's so much focus on when and how and what you feed that infant. And it just like the, the allowance of all these other things into yeah. the diet just explodes around toddlerhood, or maybe if you're lucky, like they get to school age and then they know that. And and so I think a healthy amount of going back to let's not feed our kids crap. Let's not eat crap yeah. ourselves as much just, as is possible, knowing that yeah. we live, you, you know, knowing that it's hard and it's often an uphill bot battle, but um, to the degree possible, Lots of vegetables, lots of colorful fruits, nuts, legumes, right. things that have omega threes naturally in them. Salmon, chia seeds, walnuts. In general, I think we're all going to function better <laughs> on that type of a diet. Yeah, no, and these are the things that, like, I know that I'm I'm trying to make it like really simple, just because I do that. But like, um, in a way that people like, or I feel like I can remember, like I. I you know, we, I feel like we can split hairs between Mediterranean diet, DASH diet, the few foods diet, which is the worst name ever. Um, it makes it feel like you're just going to like, I'm like, I think you guys need to, somebody, you guys needed a marketing agent or something, but, um, but like if we can just like limit 
processed foods like as much as possible and like I, I yeah just don't eat crap like in that that like I think that's where I see where I think all these kind of line up together in my mind for benefit, you know? Um, uh, sorry, I know that's like, not, but. <laughs> no, I, but, I agree yeah. with you, Carl. I, I mean, I agree with you. And um, at the same time, I want to acknowledge that um, parenting in our society and trying to get yeah. good foods into our kids is, is yeah. can be really challenging. Um, and, and so. Well, especially if you have some of, of these kids who are on medications that sometimes just getting them to eat food is, or adults, like if, um, you know, I want to kind of keep it at that. Like if you just trying to get people to have the calorie intake, when some of these medications are appetite suppressants and, and, uh, you know, like I think it's, it's sometimes hard if you're just like, I don't know, man, just eat a pancake, you know, <laughs> like just have some calorie intake. That that's where it gets hard, I think. Um, but uh, I guess maybe a, a transitioning away from diet and talking about the maybe more. I think it's more complicated. Just like environmental, environmental like uh, interventions that you can do. Um, some of these are seemed easier, but I you know I think of um, you know physical exercise being like the cornerstone of 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 lifestyle interventions, um, for people with ADHD. And, and, and I, I think that a lot of people, they, they come to this on their own. I feel like, um, that they feel, it, but not always, but that a lot of, a lot of people with significant ADHD, like they, they realize at some point when they're physically active and there's even studies that represent this, like even a single, like physical activity actually like links to better, uh, even like functional MRI data, <laughs> like, and better, um, performance on exams, just like physical activity followed by exam, um, versus watching a TV followed by exam. They just do better. Um, which may be well does science, but, um, uh, and then, so I think of physical activity, I think of mindfulness, which I'd like you to kind of talk about and, uh, sleep hygiene, which I think maybe also well fall under well done science, um, and then um, you know environmental modifications with especially talking about screen time, and then there's neurofeedback, um, and Just, uh, you listed them all. <laughs> well, but I well, mean, the, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, um, I can. So, the, in terms of the physical exercise. Um, the example I'll give and ask my husband if this is okay, but you know, in, in med school, um, you know, he's highly intelligent, has ADHD. What? All huh? of a sudden, yeah. all Are we of talking sudden, about the same guy. Not talking about <laughs> yeah. So, you know, um, what I really appreciate is he, he figured it out that if he trained for an Ironman during medical school, he could tolerate studying for the number of hours that he needed to study. Right. So he was, he was always studying on some piece of gym, gym equipment. Um, and that's what allowed him to, to put in the number of hours required for that type of sustained, you know, focus. Um, I don't think this is, you know, you said it's well, well, duh <laughs> science, but truly, um, I think all humans function better with some yeah. movement and some degree of physical exercise. But if you had to pick a couple of groups of people who uh, maybe benefit even more, folks with ADHD would be at the top of my list. Um, I mean, also people with anxiety and depressive disorders, which are highly comorbid with ADHD. Yeah. So I don't think there's any, you know, I don't necessarily think there's any group of people that don't benefit from that, but in particular. And, and so where this comes into play, though, I think is the environmental, you know, mismatch that can happen for kids in certain school settings, right? When there isn't that ability, you know, that we have as adults to, let's say, you know, you're the adult on the treadmill and you're walking during your Zoom meetings, right? Or you're like, on, you're taking them on a run or whatever, you figured out a way kids don't have the, the ability to, to implement strategies that maybe adults are able to for, for ADHD. So yes, kids can play after school and run around and be wild and crazy then. Um, but I, I, I just want to make a plug for the ability for kids with ADHD to have 
increased opportunities for physical activity within their school day, um, or finding a school that values that, um, put, puts a high value on that. Um, some of the other things you mentioned, so sleep hygiene. I just talked with a really delightful 18-year-old uh, with ADHD um, about sleep hygiene, and there's nothing, you know, um, <laughs> cool or fun about it, but it's really so important. Um, I think somewhere around 80% of people with ADHD have some form of, you know, sleep latency, you know, delayed sleep uh, onset, difficulty with, you know, any aspect of sleep can be disrupted for folks with ADHD. Yep. And that's mu it's, it's, it's just so ubiquitous with, with ADHD. Um, I will say it's important to rule out obstructive sleep apnea. Um, Oh, for kids and, and adults who have ADHD symptoms because it's a reversible, treatable reason why they may be having those symptoms. or you know, So I think it, it, some people may warrant a sleep study or evaluation with a sleep specialist. That's kids a pro in particular. tip. Yeah. That's a pro tip. Because kids, yeah. so, you know, you or I don't sleep very well. I, I don't know about you, actually, but I will be, I will look tired. I will be lethargic. I will not function very well. Kids who don't sleep well, have sleep disruption, actually can look and appear highly energetic. And, mm -hmm. you know, like they've got a motor running them um, uncontrollably. And so it is, you know, a, a thing to kind of keep in mind. But yes, yeah, sleep hygiene, sleep uh, practices for folks with ADHD is going to be pretty, pretty important. Um, and so that may, may require some assistance and some sort of either like a health coach helping with that or a structured program like CBT for insomnia. Um, but, but it's definitely um, worth paying a lot of attention to. Um, one of the other things you mentioned was mindfulness practices. So, yeah. <clears throat> so I will say mindfulness almost enters into a category, not just of a lifestyle intervention for ADHD, but as an actual treatment for ADHD in terms of reducing the symptoms after you stop the treatment. So you may know that with our stimulant medications or non-stimulant medications, um, they're very good at treating acute symptoms of ADHD, but once you stop them, you don't have a long lasting benefit. You really have the symptoms return. With a mindfulness-based intervention, um, you can see benefits even months later. And actually, neurofeedback is in that category as well as an intervention for ADHD that even after the program, after that intervention is done, at least three to six months after a neurofeedback program, you can still have remission or at least reduction in your ADHD symptoms. Um, but at any rate, I think mindfulness <clears throat> um, is, a, is a great practice. I almost think coupling it with the physical activity makes a lot of sense for folks with ADHD. I find that a lot of my patients um, have an interest. They hear that mindfulness can be helpful. They cannot <laughs> sit still um, to, to begin the practice, to start working on that, that practice. And so oftentimes I find that a very kind of high intensity physical burst of, of exercise and then coupling that with the mindfulness practice right afterwards can be a, um, a way that helps them enter into it a little bit more readily. Um, if there's another one you mentioned. Well, I earlier, talked about like, um, screen time. Screen time, and yeah. Your, screen time and then... And, and with that, I kind of think about uh, uh, setting up people's environment for success. Um, and then the third thing, I think below that, or maybe you want to couple the screen time and environment together, but um, is neurofeedback, which is kind of new on my radar and I have like very little knowledge base about. Okay. So screen time, you know, there's not a ton of great research to say this is a you know, a, a game changing intervention, or you may, you may have found something. Um, you may, I, I, there's a couple studies, um, but I can tell you clinically <laughs> what I see. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it, it's one of those things where, um, you know, I, I don't know that I have a meta analysis, you know, to show that 
a great effect size for reduction or elimination of screen time. But I can tell you clinically that it helps a lot of people. Um, it, it can be uh, quite quite astounding. In fact, actually, there was a, I came across a, a therapist once who was doing um, evaluations on kids who wouldn't even evaluate a kid who was using screens. Like she, she literally was like at all. Yeah, she would tell the parents like you got to stop all screens, and then we'll see what's left behind, and we'll do the we'll do the evaluation, we'll do the assessment. And I actually wow. kind of I mean I have to respect that. It's a bold statement, um, and respect, <laughs> respect, <laughs> respect. Um, it's you know it's a super hard thing to implement, but I I think it's valuable to I mean it's kind of like an elimination oh. diet, right? Yeah. Eliminate something in your environment and see what's left behind. You can always add it back in and, you know, and, and put maybe parameters around it. Um, but, it, but I think it makes sense to at least see, do the experiment, see how it works for, for you, um, to the degree that your occupation will allow for this. Um, yeah. and see what symptoms are left behind. And then you can make an educated decision about, okay, what, what is the relationship? What, what is the ideal relationship with a screen look like for me? Um, I, I like that. Like I, I, I like that a lot because I just, I think the amount that screens affect people, like I think is, is pretty variable, but the, but on some people it's pretty, um, it changes it. It's changed their life. Like it's, um, the advent of like the phone, the screen, like this constant, like distraction and stimuli, like just can, uh, I think disrupt a lot of people's lives and make it make uh, them their ability to do things that they had previously done um, just much harder. Um, uh, what about like other environmental things? So one of the things I hear about and I've looked at research around is people with um, and kids and also in adults with auditory processing. And I know this seems like a controversial topic topic almost in the child development world and um maybe maybe it is in psychiatry but like because I, I don't think some people believe in necessarily separate like auditory and visual like processing like problems uh, per se and then some people feel strongly about it um and then i know i, I don't know how much you know about like uh fil ear filters that and and that sort of science I, I am not an expert on that, but what I, I will say is that it does make sense if, I guess where I would, I'm not an expert on this. I, I'm almost hesitant to, to weigh in yeah. on it, um, but, but, but certainly more recently we have folks who specialize in auditory processing, um, many ENT kind of subspecialists who can do these evaluations. Um, and then have uh, oftentimes in the same clinical setting and intervention for it. Um, it is, or it does appear to be highly co-occurring with ADHD. Um, and so I think it's worth having on your radar if let's say, especially for me, knowing how robust people's responses can be to stimulants. If you had a trial of a stimulant medication for your ADHD symptoms and you're still um, not able to take in information um, and you, you know, um, learning environment, work environment is still really challenging for you, I think then it makes sense to see a specialist about auditory mm -hmm. processing. Um, but you may have come across more compelling, uh, you know, more compelling research to suggest it should be higher on the, on the radar or list of things to check out. Yeah. I mean, I've just seen some research that the, the thing that makes me kind of like pause is when, um, there's interventions that then lead to differences in outcome and direct testing. So like, so for example, you have a person who, um, you're testing their, like, uh, their, their understanding of, 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 I'm trying to articulate this in a way that it's kind of, 
everybody can get it. So you, you people get read a a paragraph and then they relay their understanding, their comprehension of that paragraph. And then they put in things like a filter on one ear that maybe delays the the information coming into one eardrum, right? And then down that neural pathway. Mm -hmm. And then they read them a different paragraph and they their level of understanding, their comprehension makes a leap. Um, and so when I see that data, I kind of go, oh, like w when we're talking about people having comprehension, uh, like auditory, like comprehension of like, uh, you know, 50% and then they get an ear filter and it goes to 80%. I kind of go, oh, well, okay. <laughs> There's something there. Do I understand like the exact mechanism of which that is working? And does it entirely make intuitive sense to be not, not necessarily, <laughs> but that, but I, you know, certainly that data exists. Um, mm -hmm. And, and certain universities, like um, I know Colorado State University does mm -hmm. this. Uh, there's a couple other universities across the across the U.S. that like they they and and uh, and and then sub specially like clinics that spe uh, specialize in this. It's not necessarily ear, nose, and throat people, um, but it's more like PT, um, uh, uh, which. So I. I find that, and then the same thing when I feel like there is something going on with the auditory processing, when you have a lot of people who have ADHD symptoms and they wear noise canceling headphones and there's like this sensory input that they're trying to dampen and that improves their symptoms. Like it, it feels like that same kind of feeling to me, but, um, I don't know. Go ahead. Yeah. I mean, I would, I, I just talked to a kid who, um, you know, I, the way I pay attention in class is I have at least one earbud in that is under my hoodie that the teacher can't see that's playing music. And actually I'm not doing that because I'm bored. I'm doing that so I can focus. Um, yeah. That sort of, um, that that's an interesting finding for that kid. I don't necessarily, that didn't necessarily make me think, oh, they need an auditory processing evaluation. Um, however, if it was, because it can clearly say like I'm able to attend to what the person is saying versus I could not understand when they told me the information, but when I read it in the textbook, that was different. Does that? Yeah. 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 Um, I think I might be, I feel like now I'm crossing over into stuff. I don't, I don't like fully understand and I'm definitely not an expert in, but I, I, my, I think my thought of what I would take away from people who are sitting there going like, what do I do? You know, like is to kind of, uh, seek out like, uh, PT, OT and the auditory processing, um, specifically, uh, uh, evaluation, because I think that, um, mm -hmm. I think there is something there when people are like what you're describing. Um, uh, and then the last one thing I want to talk about that's all you is the neurofeedback. Um, all me. Oh, well. <laughs> all you, sister. I don't know if that's all me. Well, I will, I will say, um, you know, we, when we talk about ADHD, the, what we call gold standard or standard treatment is going to be pharmacology plus behavioral therapy, which we haven't even really kind of talked about behavioral therapy. But we're, we're sort of talking about these other interventions outside of what you would you know, maybe more commonly um, be offered, right? Um, so I think neurofeedback deserves a mention um, in the category of maybe um, some of these complementary and inter integrative uh, offerings. Um, so it, it really does look as though, so that neurofeedback is having a, you know, EEG and somebody with ADHD symptoms um, going through a program and, and at a pretty regular basis. So we're talking about 30 to 40 sessions, um, of neurofeedback, um, usually in a clinical setting. Now, sometimes there's these sort of these send home kind of, uh, setups. Um, but there's a certain, uh, standard protocol. There's three, actually there's three standard protocols for ADHD that have the most research to support their benefit. Um, but again, um, when people with ADHD went through those treatments, um, they're having a pretty good response to it, um, you know, considered a, a medium effect size. 
which we kind of mentioned along with, um, you know, the, the few foods diet as being okay. on par with that. Um, but what was really kind of impressive to me is that the la the the lasting benefit of the intervention. So again, having a, a sustained response to that 30 to 40 treatment session, um, six to even up to 12 months after after it completed, which is just really not something that we're seeing with some of these other ADHD interventions. So um, I think it's definitely worth a mention. Um, up to 47% will have remission of ADHD. Remission meaning not just that their symptoms got better, but that they don't qualify as having ADHD. You know, you can't make the diagnosis for them anymore based on their, their current presentation. Um, and, but that's and no side with, effects, that's with right? 30, like, sorry. Oh, go ahead. That's with 30 no, to 40. That's, yeah. Yeah, that's my question. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah. Right? It's a lot. Yeah. It's a it's a commitment, right? Um, but you know, there's no side effects other than you know, there's no adverse effects, right? There's no study on neurofeedback for ADHD that's you know caused harm to somebody or, uh, but it's expensive. Now, if you do the cost benefit analysis of neurofeedback as compared to X number of years of medication management with behavioral therapy, which is currently sort of the robust intervention for ADHD. Yeah. Over you know over the long term, it seems to be cost effective, um, you know, but still a, a high up upfront cost uh, and expenditure of time um, for sure. Yeah, but like, yeah, I, w I would imagine like I don't know those a number off my head, but I imagine the long term cost of medications and, um, yeah, I imagine that would get expensive at some point, and there has to be some kind of point where those two uh converge and know. then one yeah you know, yeah yeah um well that's super interesting uh, yeah i think it, it is does seem like a lot of a commitment for for somebody like you gotta that seems like a part-time or job for a while um yeah okay one intervention i'll just say that has not been shown to be helpful <laughs> i think it's important to know what, like, what's not um there's something called cogmed which is sort of this online um, it's sort of designed to be an online cognitive uh, enhancer of working memory. Um, ha has been something that initially was really exciting, but I think the majority of the studies now um, don't seem to demonstrate that benefit after after the program is uh, is over with. In the way that neurofeedback and mindfulness based interventions seem to have a a longer lasting uh, impact. Well, that is, uh, that's a lot of information we just like, <laughs> I've, was there other stuff that, uh, that one should be doing? I think we've maxed out the attention of any possible listener. Yeah, 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 yeah. Don't worry. That, don't worry. They're listening to us on 1.5 to two speed. At least 1.5. Yeah. Well, if, when you get my voice to 1.5, it does not sound good. <laughs> it, it's, oh, it doesn't sound good at baseline though. Like. Not only do I have a face for radio, I have a, a voice for not radio. I don't know. Not radio. Right. No. no. So it's a, it's a bad combination. I have a mustache for <laughs> for video, but that's it. Do you, Carl? That's all I got. <laughs> I mean, in my mind, absolutely. In your mind, yeah. 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 Well, I, d I definitely appreciate the opportunity to widen the lens of what yeah. is available to help people and support people with ADHD, both kids and adults. I know we kind of touched on kids too. Um, yeah. Beyond, well, beyond, I, I the, think that, beyond the question, Medicaid. Yeah, I think that's one thing I, I was going to say, and I'd actually written down or like was in my thoughts was there is a lot of data in kids. There is not a lot of data in adults. Is that mm. your, like, like, cause when I went down this pathway several different times, but I'm like, there it's, 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 there's tumbleweeds going by in that world. Um, there's not which a lot is going so, on. Which is so unlike everything else in child psychiatry, where it's, we're always like looking at the adult studies for everything else and then trying to figure out what to do with kids. And yeah. this is, you're right, this is the opposite. This is... Okay. Yeah. That's just, I, I always worry that I'm like putting in the wrong search like <laughs> words or something. I'm like, why is am this I, not am going I, up? Why is this not? Like there's like a study sort of. Like, and they reference a kid study. Like, I don't know what to do. Yeah. Okay. Well, no. thanks, Kristen. I really appreciate it. And, um, 
uh, you're as always like a wealth of knowledge uh, for all things. So you're delightful it. in all your ADHD what? glory. Oh, <laughs> it is. Oh, it's your superpower. It's that. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. It's the only one I got. That and I can back up a trailer like nobody's business. And you know what else I can do? I can catch flies out of the middle of the air like nobody's business. Like, Amazing. Fly goes by, I can catch it and kill it. You could probably and, do all three of those things at the same time. And back up a trailer. I think that's yeah. probably true. Like, I think you could. Um, like if there's a fly in our house, my wife is just like, Carl. And, or like, you know, trailer into a small little narrow area. Like That yeah. I've seen. That is, it is impressive. I do not yeah. have that skill. That's all I got. <laughs> All right, Carl. All right. Thanks, Thanks again. Kristen. I appreciate it. Thanks for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. If you found it helpful, give us a five-star rating and write a review on iTunes. It really helps the podcast, and we greatly appreciate it. If you want to be a client or you want to work with us, go to wildhealth.com. Thanks again. Thanks so much for listening to the Wild Health Podcast. If you're a Wild Health patient, you might not know, but you have access to our referral program. This gets your friends and family 25% off Wild Health Services. Just head to Clarity, and in the top right corner, you'll see Refer a Friend. Click there, and you'll be brought to a page with your referral code. Happy sharing.